I'm Ritika Pasi with Aura Strategic Studies Program, and I'm delighted to be bringing you another digital conversation on the Indo-Pacific, this time on all things economic. The narrative around the Indo-Pacific geography is often one of strategic competition and convergence. This conversation focuses specifically on the opportunities to realize the economic and development potential of this space. With me are Dr. Jagannath Panda from IDSA and Dr. Jeffrey Wilson from the Perth US Asia Center. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank right. you. So uh, jumping right in, we've been witnessing a depressed global economy since the global financial crisis, rising instances of uh, economic nationalism, increasing concern over economic dependency that is le leading more and more to, uh, to gated globalization as per what analysts are calling it. The US-China trade war is of course a key example. And the pandemic has only added further fuel to these impulses. On the other hand, Asia has often been seen as the relative bright spot, especially post the global financial crisis, uh, and also now during the pandemic. As countries begin to look forward to post-pandemic recovery, finding new and strengthening existing sources of growth and development will be key. What are the prospects for the Indo-Pacific region and the Indo-Pacific countries in a post-COVID economic landscape? Can it look to itself? Are there trade and investment opportunities that India, Australia, and other Indo-Pacific countries can find among themselves, perhaps, and strengthen? Um, uh, Jeff, if you would like to start. Right, uh, thanks. Um, 2020 has been a disastrous year for the economic integration in the Indo-Pacific. Um, first, we had COVID shutdowns themselves, which crimped a number of important value chains for essential products. Um, then we've had the COVID-related recession that's followed from that. Um, we've also seen, as a response to that, a significant uptick in protectionism, particularly around medical products and agricultural products, which have challenged for some countries struggled to have their public health response to coronavirus and also even supply food in that context. Um, and finally, what we've also seen, and both Australia and India have faced this recently, is uh, trade sanctions from China which is increasingly in its political dealings internationally, not just used conventional diplomatic mechanisms, but actually threatened, and in a few Australian cases, executed um, politically motivated trade sanctions. So it's a perfect storm of everything going wrong at once. Um, this means that, that efforts to actually build the economic integration we've seen in the region, for 30 years, that's gone pretty well. It, it could go faster or slower, but it's been, for most of our lives, a steady uptick in the degree to which countries in the Indo-Pacific connect economically. 2020 is really the first year that that's going to go backwards. And so we're not going to be able to take that for granted in the way that we have for most of our lives up until now. Uh, Jagannath? Yes, uh, if we take into account the current economic situation, we need to um, uh, revisit that when was the last time the global economic crisis happened and the world economy went for recession? It was in 2008 and 9. And if we take a lesson out of that uh, period, of course, that time, the key role that was played to help recover the world economy was the People's Republic of China. And China did play a constructive role in order to help the global economy revive. But today, I think the situation has changed. If we take into account the last 12 years period, the Chinese economy has uh, uh, developed as a dominating economy and it has evolved as a neo-mercantilist economy. So therefore, this is the right opportunity to reassess the Indo-Pacific economic situation. And the uniqueness about the Indo-Pacific economic situation today is we have a blend of developed economy, middle-ranked economies, and smaller economies. And therefore, India and Australia fits into that scheme of affairs to take a leading position at middle economics. And I think this pandemic has created a new economic opportunities for all the countries to, in order to you know, discuss and debate, not only in terms of rebuilding a new supply chain networks, but also in terms of engagement process. Uh, within the smaller countries, they are going to play a key role. And if we could you know, establish a value chain network with the smaller countries, and the middle uh, income countries like uh, you know, Australia and India can take a leadership role, then there is a fortune that we could revive this current economic recession 
and we can go ahead without China. As the, as the Indo-Pacific narrative is emerging against China, we could think about an alternative viable uh, you know, economic scenario. And therefore, the role of India and Australia will be significant in this context. I want to very quickly ask a question specifically related to free trade agreements. This part of the world, especially one that is centered around Southeast Asia, has obvious, is obviously a, is a dense network of FTAs, of trade arrangements and agreements. What is the likelihood that FTAs could be one route to sort of pursue in the months and years going forward, effectively to do just that, to capitalize on these new opportunities between countries in this, in, in this space? that don't necessarily depend on, for example, China. The Indo-Pacific is actually the global epicenter of bilateral free trade agreements. Depending on what you count as a free trade agreement, there's at least 100, maybe 150 already in the region. Um, so, and particularly for a country like Australia, we have free trade agreements with practically all of our major trade partners, except for India, which negotiate bilateral negotiations are just restarting um, uh, following the recent Prime Ministerial Virtual Summit. So I think the agenda there wouldn't be doing new ones necessarily, but thinking about the quality and the performance of the free trade agreements we've got. Some of them were signed 10 or 20 years ago and focus on uh, traditional sectors, very few of them touch things like digital technologies, 21st century industries. Uh, they don't cover services. They don't cover migration, which is a, a major trade interest for India as well. So I think the agenda there with trade agreements would actually be to make them suitable for the 21st century, not just go and get more because we've, we've already got them, but actually make them fit for purpose. Um, now I'm going to uh, go back to the, this, this, this uh, question of supply chains, right, that Jagannath, you've already uh, raised. And this has been a concern that is front and center at the moment. And there is obviously a strategic rationale in reducing external dependencies, diversifying supply chains to ensure resilience in times of uh, crises and also bilateral conflicts. Beyond geopolitics as a driver, however, uh, what is the commercial scope to actually diversify value supply chains, value and supply chains in this, in this geography? Are there certain industries and sectors that come to mind when we think about, okay, how can India and its, with its Southeast Asian neighbors, for instance, or Australia, how can they engage in building regional supply chains that are independent, have a commercial sense that are going to attract businesses and producers to actually, uh, uh, you know, supply along these along these routes? Yeah, in fact, um, if you see your, this question about supply chain networks and the earlier one, the free trade economies, mm -hmm. both in a way complements with each other. There are a couple things we need to take into consideration. One, that uh, there is no definite conclusion when it comes to free trade agreements because uh, we might have an agreement but the nation state the economies the middle rank economies the rising economies they will always differ on the negotiation pattern and there will be certain clauses which will give uh, certain preferences to certain economies mm -hmm. so there is no definite uh, conclusion in a free trade agreement uh, in you know environment but while you say that i think one key aspect that we need to keep it in mind is that uh, the free trade economy to supply chain networks are linked with a range of other geopolitical issues and we cannot really uh, differentiate uh, those aspects uh, here. And one is the infrastructure development. Infrastructure is actually key to uh, regenerate the economic fortunes in the regions. If we take into, as you rightly pointed out, the Southeast Asia as the full form of the Indo-Pacific, I think most of the global economies are tied with this region because of the obvious reasons we not only have the ASEAN countries, but also bigger economies as the dialogue partners of uh, uh, ASEAN regions that is China, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, including India. We saw that India differentiating with the RCEP negotiation and taking a final drastic call not to support and join the RCEP negotiation. But that doesn't really, you know, um, close the environment when it comes to the supply chain networks, when it comes to, to the free trading environment and uh, try to create an alternative economic, uh, you know, um, uh, complementary uh, strategic environment. And I think what needs to be seen is that how the bilateral is getting transferred to the trilateral mechanisms and how trilateral to quadrilateral and better multilateral uh, mechanisms. There we could talk about economic supply chains, uh, the uh, value chain networks, 
and also cooperation in a range of issues like infrastructure, digital economy, um, you know, investment. So there, I think India as a country needs to also open up to countries like Australia and other bigger economy who are having troublesome relationship with China, for example, with Japan, with South Korea, India needs to really open up and revisit its, its FDI policy. And that will actually um, strengthen the Indo-Pacific narrative and offering a definite uh, guidelines to India Australia partnership in India. Jeff, you've been studying supply chains of critical materials, minerals and metals that are key to making modern technologies. Here again, China plays an outsized role. Are there any learnings or lessons from your study that are applicable to this conversation on creating and securing reliable supply chains? Mm. Critical uh, materials are a really good example of the supply chain challenge we both face. Um, they're a group of minerals, things like rare earths, lithium, cobalt, vanadium, there's about 30 of these that are used in a whole range of modern um, technology products, particularly electronics and also defence applications. And they're usually used in very small volumes, but they're essential. You cannot make a smartphone without a small amount of cobalt. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, China has monopolies in either the mining and or the midstream processing in almost all of these critical minerals. And we have seen China use this as a weapon before. In 2010, during a territorial dispute over the Senkaku Islands with Japan, um, China withheld supply of rare earth minerals to Japanese electronics companies for 59 days. Um, China has also implicitly threatened this to the United States in its trade dispute recently. Um, so for about 10 years, everybody's recognised the need that we need new value chains, not simply based on mi minerals coming out of a different country from China. And in fact, Australia has practically all of them in ex great volumes in our geology, but also the processing as well. The rocks aren't enough if you can't process them into use usable chemicals. Um, the big challenge here has been, has actually been a geopolitical one. Um, when facing a Chinese monopoly, particularly state-owned companies, a private sector companies in Australia, Japan, India as well, have been very hesitant to invest for fear of that Ch Chinese state-owned enterprises might just increase supply, collapse the price and drive all their competitors out to the market. Um, and so the geopolitical risk has meant that companies simply haven't been able to make the investment to set up those independent supply chains. Um, and so what we've argued that this is a real strong case for government intervention. Um, we would particularly look at Australia, Japan, India and the US as countries that could do this to try and build, not simply for any one of those countries, but multilateral supply chains that bring them together, that will need government assistance to help companies deal with the Chinese monopoly and the threats that come with that. But clearly it seems that, and I think this is a, the, both of what you've uh, um, uh, said, uh, it again reemphasizes or reinforces the fact that you know more and more it's not just about the geopolitical um, uh, backdrop or the context or the strategic rationale or the economic opportunities or challenges that we're seeing this sort of uh, tying together of both of these 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 spheres more and more increasingly and so therefore any decisions that are taken have to be keeping both of these um, uh, priorities in, 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 in consideration. I think uh, here I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, um, I, I would like to reference, I think, uh, Jagannath, something that you've, that you've written that, you know, India, for example, has this foreign policy uh, um, objective when it comes to multilateralism or when it comes to partnerships of pursuing plurilateralism, of pursuing multi-alignment. And uh, I liked how you put it that perhaps it's time to shift from multi-alignment to pointed alignments, effectively groupings that meet both strategic and economic objectives, right? Again, because they're so intertwined today. And this brings me to the next sort of theme that I'd like to touch upon, which is the institutionalized, institutionalization of economic processes and engagements in this space. Institutionalizations are going to be important if the Indo-Pacific as an economic space is ever to become a reality, right? Here then, because of the geopolitical tensions, the increased power tensions and the trust deficit that we're seeing between players and stakeholders, given that can existing institutions 
really meet the, 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 the challenge of realizing an Indo-Pacific economy. Uh, I'm thinking of APEC, where you know, there has been this conversation for, the, for a very long time about adding India to the grouping and making a 20th century, uh, 20th century institution come forward into the 21st century. I'm also thinking of, for instance, Iora, which fits the Indian view of the Indo-Pacific and is an existing institution, but in recent years, there has been some new, some, some fresh breath of uh, life, some bre fresh uh, um, uh, breath of air with regards to that institution. So Jeff, if you wanna maybe talk about whether existing institutions, uh, even with necessary reform, are enough to realize the potential of the Indo-Pacific or if new institutions and bolder frameworks are needed. You know, here again, there's RCEP, absolutely, but uh, Jagannath, you mentioned trilateral formats, quadrilateral formats. There's also uh, third country cooperation. There's also sub-regional efforts. So Jeff, if you wanna maybe uh, come in here. I think you, you've hit the nail on the head is that most of the economic institutions we have in the Indo-Pacific region are very old now. Most of them were set up around about the end of the Cold War and reflect both in their membership, but also their form and function, the kind of historical features you had at that time. Um, so one problem is that India is absent from nearly all of the main ones, um, which means that they're not really Indo-Pacific, they're really Asia-Pacific in their outlook. But they were also mostly established during a time of relative political comity, the Cold War had ended, everyone was doing trade and investment to beat their swords into plowshares in Asia, and, and that they were based on kind of bottom-up dialogue processes like that. Um, the region's now bigger and India is a player of systemic weight in the region. Australia is no longer a player of systemic weight in the region as we were in 1989. Um, and, and equally, the political context has become far more contested. Um, but what we haven't seen is any update at all. Um, we still do things the same way we did in the early 1990s, uh, ASEAN-centred institutions that provide talk shops where everyone talks about economic policy and nothing happens um, for 30 years now. Um, and this is going to be a real barrier to actually doing things. So as you said, and I think Jagannath might mention this now, we have seen a lot of countries saying, well, those big institutions aren't working, so we're going to try for smaller partnerships, bilateral, trilateral, quadrilateral kind of size groupings where a small group of like-minded players can roll up their sleeves and get on with it. Uh, Jagannath, if you could address this question and also perhaps add a few lines or your comments or share thoughts on Iora and what role that can play in sort of energizing, you know, one region, one sub-region of the Indo-Pacific specifically in terms of economic and uh, uh, economic development. Sure. In fact, quite agree with Jeff. Uh, uh, I think we need to see the emerging context in a new uh, new way. We cannot really revisit the history and just say that these were the fault lines and therefore we need to recorrect those, those fault lines. I think the need of the hour is uh, to create new mechanisms, new engagement process. Therefore, I argued in one of my piece that uh, Indian foreign policy could focus uh, instead of on multi-alignment to pointed uh, alignment or pointed engagement process. I think that's the need of the hour. We need to really focus in what are the institutions in the Indo-Pacific regions that are relevant to Indian interest, as well as the like-minded countries interest, including Australia, Japan, and US. Uh, as Jeff rightly pointed out, I think there was a time we were talking about Asia Pacific and that didn't really work out for India. India was an exclusive power there because we couldn't really make it to APEC as a, as a member. But today we, we have arrived at a situation and the economies are, despite of the recession, despite of the global slowdown, I think we are having a range of competing economies. Uh, there is a need of uh, promoting mechanisms and institutions that would take care of the interest of the regions. For example, PM Modi actually talked about Indo-Pacific Ocean initiatives, and that is one of the mechanisms which could be developed and tied up with the IORA. IORA so far has been a passive organization. We need to really bring it as an, uh, you know, promote it as an active organization. India and Australia could play a leading role. And one of the mandate of the IORA has been to look at the blue economy, uh, look at the resources which is there in the Indian Ocean regions. Uh, that could be actually really 
be the focal point of cooperation because that brings economy and maritime strategies together. Uh, more than that, I think what we could actually talk about is that there is a um, over emphasis about a quad being turning into a kind of a military alliance. I don't think uh, that's really a judicious approach to do and uh, convert it into a military alliance uh, you know, practice. Uh, I think certainly uh, Australia coming to Malaba is not certainly going to make Quad a military alliance. And I think Quad and Malaba are two different enterprises. We need to really, really uh, make a distinction about that. And I think, but saying that, I think the Quad has a role to play. And therefore, Quad could bring about more economic component and focus on institutional architectures, um, how to cooperate on, on, on different mechanisms, and how to also focus on the supply chain networks, because what should not only talk about the maritime security issues, it could talk about marine economy, it could talk about the free trade economies, it could talk about free trade agreements, or this, uh, you know, the comprehensive partnership economic agreement that India and Australia are actually talking about. So those are the, those are the forums and trilateral, quadrilateral and bilateral forums are there, where we could bring more economic component to it. And that will obviously strengthen the security process in the regions. And IORA has a role to play. And I think both India and Australia could play a significant role. There. You know, uh, whether or not Quad becomes a comprehensive grouping, you know, whether Quad or Quad Plus arrangement, you know, this becomes a, a pillar of a pillar institution in the Indo-Pacific that not only secures strategic or security needs, but also economic needs, developmental conversations. That I think remains to be seen because so far, even though yes, there have been uh, some, uh, uh, you know, some 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 people, some researchers who have advanced that it should be broader than just the military aspect, there do remain questions I feel on just how viable that is given the urgency and the immediacy of the, of, of the threat perception of all the members in, in, in the grouping. But this point about, you know, and I liked how you put it that, okay, you have bilateral engagements, trilateral, quadrilateral, and then you build them up, you know, uh, upward into bigger uh, networks. But doesn't this, um, uh, this sort of multiple engagement also bring the risk of 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 um, of overlap redundancy and just a, a dilemma perhaps between focus and diversification that even as like-minded countries get together in different arrangements to meet specific and in, in, and uh, uh, specific but narrower interests that in this duplication of multiple formats effectively there is a loss of focus, perhaps. I think I would like to uh, draw upon you know, the lessons we need to learn from the Chinese foreign policy here. Mm -hmm. You know, how China has actually built the strength over the years. When they opened the uh, foreign policy door in 1979, they went for gradual opening of their foreign policy. And at the beginning of the 21st century, what we saw is that they were focusing ex excessively on the neighborhood and extending to the regional uh, you know, foreign policy framework and then having a global foreign policy framework in the second decade of the 21st century. So there has been a gradual development of the Chinese foreign policy. And I think this is where most of the like-minded countries' foreign policies should actually take in uh, strong lessons from the Chinese foreign policy. Uh, at least from India's point of view, this could be argued, if not so much from US and Australian point of view, because they are actually bigger economies, including the, the Japanese economy. And I think, that uh, uh, partially addresses your questions. We cannot have a generalistic foreign policy by saying that we need to really believe in an inclusion process. Yes, inclusion process really strengthen the Indo-Pacific narrative, but that doesn't really give you the national oriented targets or the objectives that the like-minded countries are actually um, aiming to achieve. Um, the objectives of India, Australia, Japan, and US in this particular context is almost overlapping and almost similar. And the objective here is to promote each other's national interest as much as possible, while balancing out the Chinese outreach and Chinese influence, which is actually threatening uh, not only their national security interest, but also economic interest. And I think each of these four countries, the Quad countries, they do have a common interest here to capitalize on. And I think there we need a pointed alignment on issue-specific issue uh, basis, and we could focus on Southeast Asia, we could focus on Indian Ocean regions, and also 
in in Pacific uh, Ocean regions where Australia is an active player, Japan has security interest, but India has not really shown much interest. So it needs to be a pointed alignment, pointed engagement process in the Pacific, and I think that will really be fruitful for the Quad countries. Uh, Jeff, if if I pose, I mean, if, if, we, if we ask the same question, uh, uh, if I put the same question to you, but in a slightly different manner, in the sense that if you do have these, these sort of um, pointed alignments, as Jagannath has, uh, uh, has put it, uh, if you do have this, what about the consequence of increasing competition in the, in the system, that through diversification, we may actually see insecurity increase between, for example, uh, China, initiatives versus quad initiatives that has been one of the the concerns that in in given this trust deficit and given this increasing power competition oftentimes countries are not able to actually pursue their interests right they get caught between hedging half the time so will that actually complicate the the potential to realize outcomes actual outcomes intentions aside given this increase, uh, increased perception of competitiveness among different uh, visions and uh, approaches? Uh, to, to some extent, I, th I think you're right, but the situation has changed in the last few years. And I think what we've seen with China's so-called wolf warrior diplomacy mm -hmm. this year, 2020, that has really accelerated the level of competition here. Um, Jagannath makes a point about inclusivity sometimes being a problem in achieving things. I would go further. I would say often when we say this is an inclusive institution, it's really a code word for lowest common denominator. Yeah. It, we will have a very low expectation and the country, the smallest country that has the smallest reservation for domestic reasons can shut the whole process down. You know, APEC is an inclusive dis institution that does nothing but talk between bureaucrats. Um, ASEAN is an inclusive institution and we've seen how a few small members can effectively derail a coherent ASEAN position on the South China Sea dispute, you know, under the patronage of China. Um, and, and while in an earlier period of less, you know, at least economic harmony between states, you might have said, well, that inclusivity is a strength because we're all moving in an openness and cooperative direction. At different paces and different ways, but history's going in that direction, so let's try and bring the slow along. Um, I think what we've seen with uh, with China's behaviour recently is that that inclusiveness will be exploited to veto and to stop and to stop progress. And and so while I'd entirely take the point that reproducing multiple institutions will lead to competition and you know a, a less focus being on certain ones and things working across purposes, that would have been true ten five years ago, even a year ago. But in the situation of where we have at the moment where China has made it very clear this year in its trade disputes with practically every country in the world that it intends to weaponise economic independence in its favour, um, the notion that you can have an inclusive economic order and that that's, a, that's possible, it, it's desirable, but if you, do, if you do that, it will simply mean allowing China to veto everything that we might want to achieve jointly. Great. Last question I want to throw to both of you has to do specifically with infrastructure investments, infrastructure diplomacy. And we know that Indo-Pacific has huge infrastructure financing needs. China, of course, has been a first mover advantage in the 21st century. And uh, the problems and on the ground and in its approach we've been, that we have now witnessed uh, is leading to greater space for other stakeholders to come forward and put their visions and alternatives and options on the table. How would you rate India and Australia's efforts, respectively, with regards to their infrastructure diplomacy thus far? And in terms of improving the competitiveness of their visions and their offers on the table, what is the way forward? What are the sort of advantages that India and Australia can really sell on? As I see, I think uh, this is one area where uh, neither India nor Australia have actually exploited in their bilateral partners. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, uh, only recently we have tried, started talking about a comprehensive partnership. And uh, infrastructure can be one of those areas where uh, this relationship can be built. But again, we have to go to the basics to take, uh, you know, um, take the stock of the situation. One is that bilaterally, 
both the countries has to talk about signing and expediting the process of you know comprehensive economic partnership i think that's the key uh, to the infrastructure cooperation any kind of infrastructure investment we will be seeking from australia to come to india uh, and australia has a great scope to emerge as a key funder uh, along the lines of japan along the lines of uh, south korea so i think that needs to be really discussed between the two countries but i think while saying that uh, it our india australia partnership should not be really bilateral specific or bilateral oriented as we are today talking about a comprehensive partnership i think the focal point of india australia infrastructural cooperation should be on a trilateral mode to quadrilateral mode very general that has to be of course a gradual process but i think here we need to take into serious account of the existing mechanisms or institutions that actually um, promotes the scope for infrastructure cooperation for example japan has a um you know for last five years they are having a robust policy of uh, expanded partnership for quality infrastructure. infrastructure originally they introduced as a quality partnership for infrastructure but later on they revised it actually india and australia can promote this as a uh, trilateral medium of cooperation not only in the indo pacific regions but also in the um, southeast asian regions the the other point is that if we try to see from india uh, australia and us point of view again from a trilateral point of view i think um, and also from a quadrilateral point of view uh, blue dot network could emerge as another focal point uh, what we what the you know the americans and uh, the japanese including the australians are talking about um, all these three big economies they have a consortium of private and public enterprises coming together and talking about quality infrastructure and certifying it I, and i think that's the key to blue dot network india is not really a part of the blue, blue dot networks last time when donald trump came to india there was a discussion about this india is yet to accept and join the blue dot network but given the kind of scenario that is emerging at it i think india must consider it positively to join the blue dot network so that that becomes a quadrilateral trilateral that actually strengthen the quadrilateral and trilateral process for infrastructural cooperation so i would uh, i would uh, you know uh, briefly state that the scope of the uh, infrastructural cooperation does not always has to be seen in a bilateral process uh, of course uh, the bilateral investment from australia to india has to increase and uh, japan along the line of japan and south korea but again i think we need to take into consideration the greater regional initiatives their blue dot networks epqi and other initiatives like asia age initiatives the indo pacific initiatives that the trump administration is talking about we need to exploit those process not only in favor of india but also in favor of australia taking a leadership role in the uh, maritime asia and in the greater indo pacific region jeff as you uh, quickly uh, finish with uh, your thoughts on on um, on on infrastructure development and diplomacy uh, if you could uh, uh, focus specifically on what competitive advantages australia has to offer mm. in this space yeah yeah look australia has had to be very focused in how we do this um the strain economy is only we're a middle power in the region and our economy doesn't have the capacity to pump out over a trillion us dollars or more that china is doing for the belt and road or even the several hundred billions that the japan is sinking into the partnership for quality infrastructure um we also have a bit of a a comparative disadvantage in that some of the more basic infrastructure things like just laying down concrete or pouring uh, pouring concrete and steel which is what china specializes in is not something where australia has comparative advantages in our economy um and so the strain approach is to be to to recognize where we are strong and focus those um so the focus has been on two aspects it's been on higher quality infrastructure that has a higher um knowledge and technology component um and we've also focused in our foreign policy on the pacific islands region which is often overlooked by many players but has historically had a lot of strong connections with australia and has actually been targeted by a lot of chinese loans and um infrastructure uh, diplomacy over the last few years So a good example of this is some of Australia's infrastructure efforts in the Pacific Islands, particularly the Coral Sea cable, which is an internet cable that's going to greatly up, upgrade internet availability throughout the Pacific Islands. Um in the scheme of the trillions of dollars that the region needs for infrastructure, that's possibly only a small project, but what it demonstrates is if you have limited resources, Australia's focus has been on focusing on what we do well 
and targeting that on countries that are most important. I just finish with um, something, a country that I think is a good example of this is in, in Japan's involvement in Indonesia, where um, Japan had on a few occasions got involved in bidding wars with Chinese companies yeah. for infrastructure projects. And rather than cutting the cost and trying to cut their own throats on the deal, um, there was a number of projects that went to Chinese bidders that didn't work out because they weren't of the right quality or they couldn't be done. And in fact, we've seen some high-speed rail projects come back to Japanese partners because while they weren't the cheapest, they worked and they were fit for purpose. Um, and I think this really shows that there are limits to China's model of spending a lot of money to pour cheap concrete throughout the region. When in the 21st century, most countries in the region can do that for themselves now. We're actually talking about digital, cyber, advanced ports and handling facilities. You know, these are the things that are going to matter that countries in the region need external help to do. Um, and Japan has got a really winning formula for that. I would argue that given the alignment with Australia's expertise and indeed where India's economy is going and what India's need is going to be over the next decade, this is a real opportunity for Australia and India. And if I was to be critical, I would say that Australia and India need to work with Japan more on this front. <laughs> this brings us to an end to today's conversation. The path to building an economic Indo-Pacific exists. There is a choice of like-minded partners, economic objectives in today's environment of weaponized interdependence are becoming clear, and frameworks and formats exist whether updating existing FDAs or collecting together in issue specific gathering uh, groupings, bilaterals, trilaterals, quadrilaterals, whether to facilitate investments, diversify supply chains, or to build infrastructure. Thank you, Jagannath and Jeffrey for joining me today. <laughs>